All right, guys. Today we're learning about storms and instability. This is what it's all about. We've been building to this point. It's going to be awesome. We learn about air pressure and movement of wind, uh, relative humidity. We're going to make it rain. Air mass instability, all that means is warm air wants to rise, and it's surrounded by colder air. It keeps on rising. It'll hit the dew point temperature, release water from water vapor into water droplets. And that's how we get thunderstorms, lightning, tornadoes, and hurricanes. And on a bigger scale, we'll talk briefly about El Nino and the Southern Oscillation. All right, guys, thunderstorms. This is Mordor, not really. This is a volcano erupting into a thunderstorm, and bad things happen. Beautiful thunderstorm out over a lake. Classic updraft, classic downdraft. And with this picture, I want you to think instability. Okay? This is this big, puffy cloud that's rising taking off into the upper atmosphere because it's really warm air it's pumping out latent heat like storm is just exploding into the upper atmosphere very unstable and at the bottom of that sucker is going to be a big storm i want you to diagram this in your notes the two major components of a thunderstorm updraft and downdraft you have to have an updraft because air has to rise so it gets uh, so it cools off right that's the 100 percent relative humidity dew point level Generate water droplets. Those water droplets get so heavy in a storm that they'll eventually fall out. They drag air with them when they fall out. That makes a downdraft, bringing cold air with them. Um, if those rain droplets hit themselves hard enough, you'll get hail. And that's because water droplets don't want to freeze. Even though it's below freezing, they don't want to freeze because um, the water has to expand when it freezes. And it takes extra energy to do that. So only the biggest storms have water droplets hit themselves hard enough to form hail that will then fall out of the storm. Updraft, downdraft, thunderstorm. Okay, common thunderstorms. Uh, common thunderstorms, they go through this cycle. So you have the initial instability, the warm air rises, you reach 100% dew point, you release the latent heat as water vapor condenses into water droplets gets bigger and bigger and eventually those water droplets get so big they'll fall out of the cloud you have a big updraft a big downdraft this is your mature stage but eventually that downdraft is pumping cold air down below the storm and that basically cuts off the updraft and then it will dissipate these thunderstorms they'll report uh, they will repeatedly form and die and they're not very powerful I mean they can be powerful but not super full here's a picture of a not very powerful thunderstorm Another type of thunderstorm is a squall line thunderstorm. And these are big baddies. These can make uh, tornadoes very, very strong. And what happens is, is you have a big thunderstorm that's moving quickly over the surface of the Earth. Something's pushing this whole system. And so the downdraft that comes out of the thunderstorm forms an actual little cold front in front. And it forces the hot air that it runs into up into it and gives it a constant source of energy in this hot, moist air getting shoved into it. And they're very, very powerful storms. But as it comes at you, it's a worse first storm. And that's the reason why is if you're going to get a tornado, it's going to be right here in the updraft. So you'll see it. And these can be very powerful. Here's a classic squall line thunderstorm that hit Phoenix, October 6, 2010. Uh, right here is your dome of cold air that's coming out of the downdraft. That dome of cold air is forming up, forcing up the warm, moist air in front of it. And this is where your updraft is. And you can't tell in this picture, but this whole system is moving at the person who took this picture at something like 40 miles an hour. It's incredibly fast. And it didn't happen here, but right here in the updraft, there was a tornado that flipped over this car um, at a different point when it was in the city. So anyway, super cool. All right. Uh, coincidentally, supercell thunderstorms. These are the biggest ones you get. Okay, they get so big that so much moisture, or I'm sorry, air gets shot up that it basically tops out. It hits the tropopause, and that's where uh, UV light's being absorbed by ozone, making it warm up here. So it's really hard to get air to stay unstable up here because it's so warm up here, and so it tends to flatten out and build this big anvil because um, this air will then be cooler than the uh, warm air up here from absorbing UV light. But in the biggest storms, you'll get an overshooting top that doesn't matter. This air is still warmer, and it, boom, explodes into the next the troposphere. Not the troposphere, the stratosphere. Blows up into the stratosphere from the troposphere. Incredibly cool. 
Uh, these are the super bad storms, worst second storms. And that's because out here in the downdraft is in front. As this storm moves from left to right, you get hit with rain or hail out here. And these are going to be intense storms. And then the tornado, where the updraft is, is going to be behind it. And then sometimes you can have a flanking downdraft here where there's a rain here and here. And sometimes it will surround the actual tornado itself so you can't even see it, um, making it obviously very, very dangerous. Here's an image of it. They tend to have a classic hook feature. They're spiraling like this. And that funnel funnels in warm moist air right into this pocket, right into this powerful updraft. And that's where you're going to get your really powerful um, tornado. Then once the air is aloft, it heads out over here and it will fall forming your forward uh, flank downdraft or it can fall back here forming a rear flank downdraft. And here's just some awesome pictures of supercell storms. We don't really get them out here in Phoenix. I mean, look how big these things are. Look at the anvil that spreads out from the storm as it smashes into the uh, stratosphere. Absolutely amazing. Okay, tornadoes. Um, here's the conditions necessary to form a tornado. You need warm and humid air at the surface, cold and dry air aloft, winds moving faster aloft or at a different direction than at the surface, and that's called wind shear. You have to have warm, humid air at the surface, and the reason why is it doesn't seem this way, but humid air is actually very light, and that's because you have a lot, so much moisture in it. Uh, moisture is water vapor is uh, oxygen and two hydrogens, which is much lighter than most air molecules, like nitrogen is two nitrogens or oxygen is two oxygens. And so it's light, so warm, fluffy air down here, and it wants to rise into the cold, dry air aloft. And if it's dry, it's going to be even more dense, and they want to switch places. So the cold, dry air up here wants to go down, the warm air poof, wants to get sucked up, or moist air, I'm sorry, and that's where you get your tornadoes is that warm, moist air get shot up. Look at these cool pictures of it. Uh, lastly, you need that uh, wind shear, and that's what allows the thing to circulate and spin. You need winds at aloft moving faster at a different direction than they are down below. This is a cool diagram showing you tracks, um, tornado tracks over the past 56 years. Look at that. Eastern United States just gets slammed. Uh, definitely right here in uh, Tornado Alley. Um, there's more tornadoes happening here than anywhere else in the world, and that's because you got a great source of warm, moist air here in the Gulf of Mexico, and a great source of cold, dry air up, cold, dry air up in Canada. When they two meet, boom! Massive instability, massive thunderstorms, and tornadoes. Uh, here's your Fujita tornado intensity scale. Uh, F zeros are the most common, up to F fives, which are the least common, but F fives are the most powerful. They can have winds over 260 miles an hour, destroy well-built houses, and they can make cars, missiles carried over 100 meters, okay? Very, very destructive. And this is uh, kind of the breakdown. You'll hear that often when they describe a tornado. It was an F2 or it was an F3. And just because it's an F2, that doesn't mean it's this weak thing. They can still destroy a mobile home and have wind speeds well over 100 miles an hour, up to 150 miles an hour. Uh, here's an F5 that went over a small town in Kansas and utterly obliterated it. Okay, incredibly powerful. This is a picture of an F4 tornado. So one, a more powerful tornado hit this area. This is an F5. Okay, when they're that big, they're called wedge tornadoes. They can be over a mile and a half to two miles wide. And even though they're destructive and terrible, it's hard not to think they're beautiful. I mean, look at these pictures. Absolutely amazing features of our planet. I've never actually seen one. I would love to, likely from a distance. Uh, they're an incredible feature of our planet. <sighs> beautiful pictures. Okay, cool. Fish falls and frog falls. Here's a beautiful uh, twin tornado over water. And sometimes tornadoes can suck up fish or frogs, keep it aloft in the storm, and then it dumps it on the land, sometimes hundreds of miles away from the ocean and obviously freaks out the people where it lands. Here's some more damage. This is a tornado, I believe this was an F3, destroyed this school. You always gotta remember the downside of tornadoes. Uh, lightning, I am absolutely terrified of lightning. Uh, I've been uh, almost struck a couple times. Ugh. Anyway, 
Lightning can heat air to 54,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and that happens to be five times hotter than the surface of the sun. Uh, try not to think about that the next time you're in a lightning storm. What happens is, is the raindrops are falling out of the thunderstorm. They will drag on the cloud itself, and they pick up um, negative electrons, just like if you dragged your feet on a carpet. And those electrons will get stored in the bottom of the cloud, making it very negatively charged. And then eventually, that negative charge will discharge to something on the ground that's positively charged, and boom, you get your lightning bolt. Specifically, the negatives come down and discharge down on the bottom. And this is if you're down here and your hair sticking up, run away, because that invisible channel, once it's formed, will flash with a return stroke that, boom, allows the el electricity to travel along that positive chain down to the surface. Boom. And even though it's terribly terrifying, lightning can also be very beautiful. But don't hide under a tree. Or, well, don't get hit. <laughs> All right, thunder. Uh, what happens with thunder is lightning so hot, 54,000 degrees Fahrenheit, that when it heats up the air, the air expands so quickly from that heat that it breaks the sound barrier. So it's like cracking a whip. That's why it's boom, because the wind will break the sound barrier. And that wears the, the sound barrier is the same thing that breaks when you have an airplane. This is an airplane breaking the sound barrier. This is the space shuttle breaking the sound barrier. As an object breaks the sound barrier, it accelerates to the speed of sound but when it's right at the speed of sound, all the noise that it generates stays with it. So it builds this big bubble of sound until the object passes through it, goes faster than the speed of sound, and then this big, basically, dome of sound, boom, will then reverberate over the landscape. The same thing happens with lightning, except it's all along the length of the uh, lightning bolt. Okay, hurricanes. Um, Hurricanes, uh, classic feature is you always have an eye. These are big tropical systems that happen near the equator, but they don't happen on the equator. Uh, big, powerful, organized system of thunderstorms. The most powerful thunderstorms are going to be right along the eye wall, and they spin around the dominant eye. And this is a very, very low, the lowest pressure that forms on our planet, spins around uh, generating a hurricane. To form a hurricane, you need no wind shear. Uh, with a tornado, you need wind shear to allow the thing to spin, but with a hurricanes, if you have wind shear, it'll rip the thing apart. You need to be away from the equator because you have to have geostrophic winds. The geostrophic winds are those winds aloft that will just spin around the low and never make it to it. That allows the hurricane to have structure. And you need warm water, which is the fuel for a hurricane. You need that warm, moist air that will then rise and lift into the hurricane and power it. Uh, here's some sizes. This is Typhoon Tip, 1,200 miles across, Ugh, monster hurricane. Uh, this is the heart largest we've had in the Atlantic, Hurricane Ike. And then there's little tiny Marco. Okay, uh, there's the Saffir Simpson hurricane scale, which you hear about all the time, Category 1, Category 2. Same idea. One's not so big, five's really big, but still one is still a hurricane. You should definitely seek shelter. Wind 74 to 95 of the Category 1, but those, that's sustained. That means the winds never go below that amount. And if you're standing out in 74 mile an hour winds, you're going to have a hard time standing. So these are very, very powerful. Uh, the bigger the hurricane, the bigger the storm surge. The storm surge is, as these hurricanes spin around, they basically build up huge piles of ocean water uh, through waves underneath them. And those piles of ocean water underneath them, when the hurricane makes land, will slosh up on the shore and are very, very destructive. Bigger the hurricane, bigger the storm surge. This is, her, this is Hurricane Katrina, 250 miles an hour. That's how fast the winds got, 902 millibar pressure, very low. Remember, normal is 113. And a storm surge of 30 feet. Absolutely unbelievable, unbelievably powerful storm. This is Hurricane Rita, 200 miles an hour, 898 millibars, 20 foot storm surge. Another picture of Katrina, just a monster storm. Hurricane Rita, this is neat. Uh, the reason both Katrina and Rita were so powerful is uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, they had this really warm current of water known as the Loop Current. And that anomalous warm water is what fueled the hurricane to make it as powerful as it was. Okay, um, Hurricane Katrina, 
in hurricane damage in general. The most da damaging thing in a hurricane is storm surge, then flooding, then wind. This picture shows that. So first let's do wind. Uh, the roofs of, this of these buildings have been ripped off. That's from wind damage. And I'm sure there's other damage that we can't see associated with wind. That's bad. Uh, flooding. The ocean that was here washed ashore and actually flooded this entire region. That's bad. Nobody wants ocean waves into their house. It's actually so bad that there were people who were in these houses that when the ocean water came in, they went from their first floor to the second floor up into the attic and the water kept rising and some of them drowned. Others basically cut holes in the, their roof with, uh, I think it was chainsaws, and had to escape onto the roof in the middle of the hurricane. But last we have storm surge. And storm surge is that, that dome of water that gets sloshed on shore. So even though these homes got flooded and their, their roofs ripped off, these homes got ripped off their foundation and the, the debris dumped here. Okay, incredibly destructive. Uh, here's another picture of storm surge. These are all um, train cars. Uh, that's a boat, obviously a shipping container boat. Very, very destructive. Flooding's bad too. Uh, these are homes during Hurricane Katrina that are below sea level, so when you had flooding, there's no easy way to get the water out. And then you have wind. Uh, this is a cool picture. This is a, uh, a wind turbine that was experiencing a hurricane level winds, and it just blew the thing apart. Which is kind of neat. This is a massive hurricane below a weather satellite. That's so cool. And that sucker is generating a lot of wind. All right, lastly, we have the El Nino and Southern Oscillation. And all that means is, and you hear in the news a lot, typically you have La Nina, but sometimes you get El Nino. And El N La Nina is what's more typical. And what you have is the trade winds will take cool ocean water over here near South America and move it along the equator and as it moves along the equator it warms up and then you get a bunch of storms over here in Australia and it tends to be very dry out here but it can reverse and you can get warm water that heads the opposite direction I'm sorry cold water that heads the opposite direction and then here you'll end up with a pool of warm water that allows storms to develop in North America and South America and we'll end up getting a lot more moisture uh, we're predicted to have a uh, El Nino this year, which is uh, good. This is how they kind of fluctuate over time. We could use an El Nino because we are in a drought. No bueno. Okay, so things I want you to know. Two parts of a thunderstorm. The three major types of thunderstorms. How lightning works. Conditions necessary to form tornadoes. How hurricanes form and dangers associated with hurricanes. And what is ENSO.